In the Old Testament, Jesus said, All who hate me love death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Accepting Him as your Lord and Savior and choosing to follow Him puts you on the way. Obeying the truth of God's Word keeps you on the way, the way that ends in eternal life. Your eternal destiny will be determined by your choices in this world. Steps to Life exists to help people find the way, the truth, and the life. As we open your word now and study it and try to understand it, we humbly pray that your spirit will direct and guide us and bless our efforts as we try to become an educated church in the knowledge of your word. We pray that we might be ready for that day when you've told us that our Bibles will be removed from us. May we have it in our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I've entitled a few remarks that I wanted to study with you today for the title, Are You Ready for the Unexpected? And <clears throat> this actually is a fairly major topic in the Bible. The Bible has a great deal to say about things that are unexpected. As a starter, a look in the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter, and this is Jesus speaking, and he says here, starting in verse 32, But of that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now when I was young, and I read this scripture, I just assumed that this scripture was talking about the second coming of Christ. That's what I assumed it was talking about. And if anybody told me that they believed it was talking about the second coming of Christ, I wouldn't contradict them. However, I now believe that it's talking about when your name or my name comes up in the judgment. You see, the second coming of Christ will be announced to all the world. Now, the wicked won't be able to understand it, but the saints will understand it. They will know the day and the hour, and that announcement will be made to the saints a number of days, Ellen White says, before Christ returns. So, Christ's actual return in the clouds of heaven, if you're one of his children, that will not be a surprise to you. It will have been announced a number of days beforehand. But there is a time when the Lord's going to come to you without any announcement. I want to read it to you from the book Great Controversy, page 483. This is in the chapter on the investigative judgment. It says, as the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God, beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned, every case closely investigated. Names are accepted, names rejected. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life, and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. The Lord declared to Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Exodus 32:33. And says the prophet Ezekiel, When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, all his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. Ezekiel 18, 24. So, when is it that the Lord's going to come suddenly? And it will be when you don't know when it's going to be. It'll be, it'll be during the judgment of the living. And during the judgment of the living, the Lord is going to come to your name. 
and he's going to come to my name. If you're a Christian, your name is registered in the book of life in heaven. And under your name, every detail of your life is recorded. Every thought you've ever thought, every emotion you've ever felt, everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, the motives for what you said and what you did, it's all recorded. Every detail is recorded. We've talked about this before, so we don't need to go over this in detail. I can prove that to you from the Bible, but you already know that. It's all recorded. Every detail of your life since before you were born, every detail of your heredity and your environment and, and, and about you, everything is there. The Bible says in the Psalms, the writer said, all of my members were written in your book. And he's talking about before he was born. Everything is all recorded. And so, when your name comes up, and there'll be a time when you don't know when it's going to be. It'll be an unexpected time. Ellen White says that every case will be as closely investigated as if you or if me, if any one of us was the only person alive on the world. Our case will be investigated that closely as if our case was the only case. It'll be a thorough, complete, exhaustive evaluation. Now, I don't know, I can't tell you how God does these things. It was almost 40 years ago, I was in a camp meeting. We were visiting this afternoon with uh, Sister Phyllis Rail, who's, uh, you probably saw us visiting after lunch. We had a wonderful visit. We had a wonderful visit because my wife and I hadn't had an opportunity to see her since 1973. And <clears throat> she was one of the leaders, and her husband was the first elder in the church in Grand Forks that uh, I was pastoring. And while we were there, we were at a camp meeting in North Dakota, and one uh, a preacher, uh, I think his name was Elder Stair, if I remember right. He was actually a, a language teacher also at Walla Walla College when we were there, and uh, he was preaching about the investigative judgment and about the judgment coming to the living. And in the course of his sermon, he says, now, he said, do you know, now this was back in the early 70s, he said, do you know how many people die in the world every day? Now, when you die, your probation stops. And when you die, you're ready for your case to be evaluated right then. And he said, do you know how many people die every day in the world? He said it's in the neighborhood. This is in the early 70s. He said it's the neighborhood of 200,000 people die every day. Now, of those 200,000 people that die every day, not all of them have professed a Christian religion. So how many people die every day that have professed a Christian religion? I don't know, and I don't need to know. But it would certainly be in the many, many thousands. And by the way, in the judgment, starting in 1844, it started with Adam and Eve, and then it goes through successive generations, and it closes with the living. So there has to be the ability to go faster than people are dying, because you have to start at the beginning and then catch up. And... So that means that they are able to handle thousands of cases per day. Now, don't ask me how the Lord does all these things. I just know that from my study of the Bible, when God says that he's going to do something, he has the ability to do it. And at some point in time, your name and my name is going to come up. We don't know when. And when that happens, when your name comes up, a decision is made, and when that decision is made, your destiny then is fixed and determined for all eternity, whichever way it is. And this is something that God's people should never, ever forget. That, as Ellen White said, we are living in the most solemn time of earth's history. Why? Because in former ages, 
Let's think this through. Let's suppose you were living in 1750. There were many millions of people living in the world in 1750. In fact, there were probably at least two million European people living in the United States, what became the United States in 1750. But if you were living in 1750, then the text in the Bible that would apply to you would be in the book of Hebrews where it says, it is appointed to men once to die and, and then after that the judgment. So if you were living in 1750, you lived your life and then you died and after your death, then your case came up for judgment. It would come up for judgment. Now it wouldn't come up till after October 22, 1844, but after you died, your case would come up for judgment. Now, by the way, the judgment is so serious when the apostles preach it. You can read it in your Bible. You can read it in uh, Acts, let's see, Acts 24, where the apostle Paul, he only had one opportunity to speak to a heathen ruler by the name of Festus, and he chose to reason with him about three things. And one of the three things that he chose to talk to Felix about was the judgment. I've always thought about that in our witnessing, you know. If you only had one opportunity, Paul only had one opportunity to talk to this heathen man. And when he only had one opportunity to talk to him, one of the things he chose to talk to him about was the judgment. Interesting, isn't it? And when the apostle Paul reasoned with Felix about the judgment, Felix began to shake and tremble inside because he was a wicked man. He knew it. The same thing happened, by the way, something very similar to Caiaphas. When Jesus said to him, you, they said, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us whether you are the Christ. And Jesus said, you said it, or you have said. However, I'm, I'm saying to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's a very interesting text. Sitting on the right hand of power is at the end of the millennium. Coming in the clouds of heaven is at the beginning of the millennium. This is a technique that you'll find that Jesus used over and over again, and it's in the book of Revelation over and over again. He stated what was last first, and he stated what was first last. And Ellen White says that when Jesus said that to Caiaphas, that in his mind, see he was a Sadducee, he didn't, he didn't believe in life after death, but in his mind, he had it flash. What if he's right and my theology's wrong? And someday I have to stand and give an account before the judge of all the earth. And Caiaphas had a lot of things that he didn't want to ever come to light again. By the way, do you have things in your life, that, in your past, that you don't ever want to come to light? Well, if you do, Notice what the Apostle Paul said about this. Look in 1 Timothy. Five. Verses twenty-four and twenty-five. First Timothy five twenty-four and twenty-five says, "Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later." Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Let's think that through a minute. It says, the, the, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. Okay? So, the, some men's, their sins go before, before they're judged. Their sins precede them to judgment, and they're clearly evident. Why are their sins clearly evident? Okay. When you confess then your sin becomes evident. If you don't confess it, it's not evident, it's hidden. Now, I hate to keep bringing this up, but it, it helps people to think it through. Uh, when I was preaching, this is over 25 years ago, and I was preaching in Australia, and I was preaching on the subject of confession. When you confess something to somebody, then it becomes evident. And you, when you confess it to the person you wronged, and you confess it to the Lord, it goes beforehand to judgment. Then it can be covered up. It can be blotted out. My understanding of making confession 
is when I come to you and I say I am, I am responsible for doing such and such. Read uh, Psalm 51. David recognized that he was responsible for what he had done and he confessed it. Now we live in a world, if you, it was on the internet just uh, yesterday, uh, maybe you saw it, I was just appalled. Uh, are you aware of the fact that there's a serial, not a serial killer, a fellow that went and killed a whole bunch of people, I think it was in the theater, and they're trying to figure out whether it's okay that whether you can execute somebody who's mentally insane. I said, wait a minute, the, I don't care what your state of mind is, if you're a human being, God holds you responsible for what you do. But we're, we've, we're completely losing sight of that today, that works like it is before the flood. Uh, so, we're, we're getting more and more mixed up about these things. But in God's reckoning, in God's book, I am responsible for what I do. And Ellen White's very clear about this. If I do something wrong, some people say, oh, the devil made me do it. Ellen White says, it is not written against the devil what I do. I'm responsible for what I do. So to make confession means that I tell you, I'm sorry for what I did. I confess what I did. I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me. In other words, I am taking responsibility for what I did. And then I go to the Lord and ask him to forgive me. And then my sin is evident. And it goes before me to judgment. But what if I don't confess? A lady came to me after I had been preaching in uh, uh, Australia in 1988. And uh, I was preaching about confession. She says, I need to talk to you. So I said, okay, we're going out to a private place out in the veranda. She says, so I got a problem. What's the problem? She said, if I confess what I have done, my husband is going to divorce me. Well, that puts me in a very awkward position. And by the way, I happened to know Adventist preachers that would tell a lady like that would just keep it quiet. But I have to, I have, to have a clear conscience too. I couldn't sleep at night if I did that. And so I said to her, I said, well, I tried to speak in a kind voice, in a soft voice, but I had to tell her the truth. I said, you know what? You are going to confess to your husband what you've done. You're going to. However, you can choose when you want to do it. You can do it now, and you might get divorced. That's possible. Or you can decide you're not going to do it now and then you can do it at the end of the millennium and believe you me you will do it at the end of the millennium because it'll be it'll be evident Ellen White says that at that time the confessions will be made of the most in the most public manner of all manner of sins that have been committed people won't be ashamed to tell anything they've done but it won't do any good to save them and that's my belief. Now, if you have a different belief, I'm not here to argue theology with you. I know Adventist preachers that say, look, that is so dangerous and that's so damaging to the family and everybody that that shouldn't be confessed. Okay, if that's your belief, uh, I respect your conscience. I don't have that belief. I just told you what my belief is. I believe that uh, a sin that I commit against somebody, that if I don't confess it and make it right now, that I'm going to confess it at the end of the millennium. It says here, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow after. What are the sins of the men that follow, what are the sins that follow after? Those are the ones, you come up to the judgment, and in the judgment, the sins are still there. They're not confessed. Maybe they're not repented of or forsaken, but they're not confessed, and so they're still there. By the way, do you, you don't want to be in that situation, do you? I don't. I, when I first understood this, and I first understood this when, when I was 19 years old, and I, don't, I was already a baptized some of the evidence, but I heard a man by the name of Elder Tyndall, and I've told you his story before too, how, uh, his, about confession. He came to our church and preached in our church where I was attending. And I started thinking. And I started thinking about all the things that I needed to confess. I had to start 
getting on the telephone, writing letters, contacting people. There were some people in faraway places, and uh, it wasn't as easy to contact people back when I was 19 years old as this. Now nobody had cell phones in, and uh, you couldn't just call somebody like you can now. And uh, I had to start contacting people and saying, <laughs> you know, such and such a time, some years ago, at such and such a year, I said this to you, and that really wasn't the way it was. This is the way it was, and I'm sorry. And uh, I had to, uh, one time, I had told, I had actually told an on-truth to, I think it was the Colorado State Patrol. Yeah, it was the Colorado State Patrol. So I had to write them a letter. <clears throat> I, I, by the way, I'd gotten out of the ticket, too, by telling a lie. And so I had, to write the, I had to write the Colorado State Patrol a letter and say, at such and such a time, I was stopped, I said this, it wasn't the truth, this is what, what the real situation was, and any fine that I, am, that I owe to the state as a result of this, any penalties, I will pay it. You need, I, I got a letter back from the state of Colorado. They said, in fact, I was very interested in the letter I got back. They said, we get many letters like this, and we are not, we're not going to fine you for what, what you did. And they thanked me for confessing it, making it right. And uh, so everybody, we're all in the same boat on this. Doesn't matter whether you're a preacher or what you're back, if you've said some damage or injured somebody, it needs to be made right. Uh, years ago already, a certain thing that I did when I was a child that was wrong. And by, I didn't tell a lie. I just allowed people to be deceived because they didn't say anything. And so was, uh, I was already up here at Steps of Life and I was thinking about this and I said, how am I going to make that right? I have a letter and it's in my desk in my office at home. It's been there ever since about 1991. It's a letter of confession. I've talked to the Lord about this even recently. And I said, Lord, I'm willing to mail this letter to get this made right any time I can find out who to mail it to. You see, the problem is uh, the, the adults that were present at that time when I didn't say anything, and as a result of me not saying anything, it kept me out of trouble, but people were deceived. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they're dead. I can't confess to them, but there are people, there, are, there were two girls, they were both friends of mine, that were present. And I would, and I wrote, uh, I wrote letters. I wrote a letter to, to confess to, in fact, I think I wrote one to each of them. But the problem is, they're married. I have no idea what their name is. Uh, I don't know, I have no idea. I don't even know if they're alive, but I don't know where in the United States they live, and I don't know their name. And so at the present time, I said, Lord, I'm going to send this letter to them to make this right if I can ever find out who it is. Uh, and... Uh, probably some of you are in the same situation that I'm in. Uh, there are things that I did wrong when I was a child, and, uh, when I, and uh, I can tell you incidents, but I don't need to tell you details. And I can't make them right now because either the people have died or there's a situations where the person that was wronged, I don't even know their name. Don't, I don't know who they are. And uh, there's a certain place whenever my wife and I travel where we uh, close to where I was born. I was born in Toppenish, Washington in the Yakima Valley and between Toppenish and Yakima there's a little town by the name of Wapato and when I was about, I've told some of you this maybe, when I was about nine years old some of us went out and uh, there was a commercial watermelon patch there and we went out and busted some watermelons and ate the hearts out of them and that was wrong because that was the watermelons that didn't belong to us and uh, the, the person that was raising them, it was commercial, so we were actually destroying some of his profit, and that was wrong. And I was about nine years old, and I, every time I pass that, when I'm traveling, I say, Lord, I would confess it, I would make it right, I would pay for the watermelons, I just, I don't know who to go to, I don't, I don't know who owned the field, I don't know anything, I don't know how to do it. I said, I'm, I'm confessing to you that I did wrong, and I'm sorry. And I want to be forgiven for that. And probably some of you have some things that you did wrong at some time in your life, and either the people have died, or you, you're like I am. You're, you're in a situation where you don't, you don't know how to contact the person. But read this text. Do you want your sins to go before you to judgment? I want my sins all to go before me to judgment. Because, believe me, friend, you and I 
are, have a case in court. And it's a court where they don't make any mistakes. Down here in human courts, we make all kinds of mistakes. Uh, and you all know that. But in the court above, they don't make any mistakes. God has an absolutely accurate record of your character, of my character. And our name's coming up in the judgment. And the decision of that judgment will determine my eternal destiny and your eternal destiny. It's coming up. It's coming up, by the way, at an unexpected time. So are you ready for the unexpected? Are you ready for the unexpected? Your name's coming up. My name's coming up. And it's going to be evaluated. Every detail of your life will be looked at. I, don't, I cannot explain how God does this. I just know that he's, that he's doing it. If you want to read in detail about it, this, I just read a paragraph from the chapter in Great Controversy on the Investigative Judgment. And <clears throat> she goes into great detail on this there. And <clears throat> that's probably the most important thing that is unexpected that we need to be ready for. But when, we, when I study this, I around to, in the Bible, there's many, many things that are unexpected. Jesus said he would come at a time when we don't expect, when you don't, don't think he's coming. And I want to look at several things in addition to the judgment that can come in an unexpected manner. Another thing that can come in an unexpected manner is death. I was, my wife and I were just talking with uh, Sister Phyllis Rail this afternoon, and I, I told you her husband was the first elder in the church that uh, we pastored in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and she was telling us how that in uh, 1989 he wasn't feeling real good. One day he was a dentist in Hatton, North Dakota, and he wasn't feeling real good, and then about a, a day or two after that, he all of a sudden had a heart attack, and in less than 24 hours he was dead. Now that was unexpected. And uh, so death can come in an unexpected way and there are many Christians, there are many Seventh-day Adventists, there are many historic Adventists, and please I'm not trying to criticize these people but I'm going to bring this up because I want you to think about it so that you don't get in this situation. So please, I am not trying to criticize people with that, that had a, a bad experience. But I think that we need to be aware of this so that we don't do the same thing. I think that many of you are aware of what happened to Jason Ford and his wife. A few years ago, they're a young couple, uh, and he and his wife were driving uh, in the wintertime, and uh, they had a car accident, and uh, both he and his wife were killed. Uh, their funeral, the double funeral, was held uh, somewhere around Muskogee or Broken Arrow, North, uh, Oklahoma, down that area. They, they uh, lived in Oklahoma. Uh, he was very active in jail ministry. Uh, I think he was self-employed. They were a young Adventist couple, a wonderful couple. We, we had Jason Ford come and speak to our uh, young people at, on different occasions and on outings that we had had in the past. And uh, when they were killed suddenly in this traffic accident, they had two little boys, wasn't it? They had two little boys, both in the infant seats, and they were strapped in the infant seats, and the boys were not hurt, but they had no parents. We were terribly sorry to find out that there was no legal work done that would dictate where those children should go if the parents died. And so, of course, in a case like that, it just goes to court, a judge decides everything, and then different people can make petitions, and the judge decides uh, where the children go. Uh, so there are a lot of Seventh-day Adventists. They are not, even if their sins are confessed, they're not ready to die. If you have any property at all, you are not ready to die if you haven't made out a will. If you have children that are underage, you are not ready to die if you don't have legal work that is prepared so that it's decided, so that you decide what happens to those people if you die. Let me read you something Ellen White said about this. She wrote, this is in volume one, the testimonies. 
page 199. God is displeased with the slack, loose manner in which many of his professed people conduct their worldly business. They seem to have lost all sense of the fact that the property they are using belongs to God and that they must render to him an account of their stewardship. Some leave their worldly business in perfect confusion. Satan has his eye on it all and he strikes at a favorable opportunity and by his management takes much means out of the ranks of Sabbath keepers. And this means goes into his ranks. Some who are aged are unwilling to make any settlement of their worldly business and in an unexpected moment they sicken and die. Their children who have no interest in the truth take the property. Satan has managed it as it's as suited him. We've seen this by the way happen and so the Lord's cause has, cause has lost, in, in individual cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Satan has managed it as, it as suited him. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, that's Luke 16. Mammon is a Greek word that just means property, real estate, money, whatever. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? My dear friend, if you die and your business is all confused and you do not have your legal work done so that your property goes to where you want it to go, don't you know you're going to have to face that in the resurrection? You're going to see exactly what happened and it's not going to be fun for you. You don't want that to happen, do you? I don't want to belabor that point. I don't want to be overbearing. Just something to, to think through. I'm very, now it didn't happen to us, but my wife and I became concerned about this when our first child, we have two children, our, when our first child was just a baby. We said, we d I did a lot of traveling those days. I was a pastor. I, one year I drove over 40,000 miles in my work because I had a very large district. And... <clears throat> My wife and I, and oftentimes my wife went with me and said, what would, what would happen if we were in a car accident? Car accidents happen to preachers as well as other people. What happened? So we decided to make out paperwork, and uh, we didn't have anybody in our families at that time that we wanted to, to bring up our son if we should die in a car accident together. And so we, we had a, got two other Christian, young Christian couples that we had confidence in. Uh, one was uh, training to be a physician. One was a Seventh -day, young Seventh-day Adventist minister. Uh, and uh, we contacted them and we said, if, if we should die, would, are you willing to be in charge of our son, to bring up our son, if we should die in a, in a common accident? And we had the paperwork filled out. They signed it. We signed it. We had a first choice. If they couldn't do it, there was a second choice so that we had determined if we should die in a car accident, who would bring up our son? Now, that didn't happen in our case, but I've never been sorry I did that. Because if you have your paperwork done, then if the unexpected happens, you're ready for the unexpected. So that's my question this evening to you. Are you ready for the unexpected? Are you ready for the unexpected? Some people are and some people aren't. The Holy Spirit comes often in unexpected ways. Here's what Ellen White wrote about this. This is the book Testimonies to Ministers, page 64. When the Holy Spirit works the human agent, it does not ask us in what way it shall operate. Often it moves in unexpected ways. Now, this gets to be dangerous because the, since the Holy Spirit works in a way that's unexpected, people don't accept the Holy Spirit because it doesn't come the way they were expecting. Y you follow the line of reason? You follow what's happening? That's exactly what happened with the Jews. She goes on to talk about this. She says, Christ did not come as the Jews expected. He did not come in a manner to glorify them as a nation. His forerunner came to prepare the way for him by calling upon the people to repent of their sins and be converted and be baptized. The Jews refused to receive Christ because he did not come in accordance with their expectations. <laughs> I've asked myself this. 
if the Holy Spirit started to work in a way that was totally different than what I imagined, would I reject it because it wasn't what I had imagined, was different than I expected? There's another reason that it is very common for God's people to reject the Holy Spirit. And it's this. When the Holy Spirit comes, now Jesus told us this in John 16. He told his disciples, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he mentions the Holy Spirit will do three things. You remember what Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do when he came? He will reprove. By the way, do you like the word reprove? <laughs> Most people don't. He will reprove the world for sin. That's one. And righteousness and judgment. But guess what? People don't like to be reproved for sin. They like to be complimented. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the first thing the Holy Spirit does is if there's sin in my life, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on that. The most urgent thing, the most urgent sin that I need to get out of my life, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on right then. I have learned by experience, I'm just telling you this as a human being, and this is not inspired what I'm telling you. This is just my observations as a human being. There may be 20 or 50 sins in a person's life, but when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit often just put his finger on one. And then when you deal with that one, as soon as you deal with that, the Holy Spirit put the finger on another one. And I could illustrate that by telling real stories, but I'll run out of time if I start telling you too many stories. But people don't like to be reproved. That's just our human nature. We don't like it. And so... This is what Ellen White said about that. Because the Spirit is to come not to praise men or to build up their erroneous theories, but to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, many turn away from it. They are not willing to be deprived of the garments of their own self-righteousness. They are not willing to exchange their own righteousness, which is unrighteousness, for the righteousness of Christ, which is pure, unadulterated truth. The Holy Spirit flatters no man, neither does it work according to the devising of man. That's what happened to the Jews. Jesus didn't come the way they expected. They rejected him. This is something it's worthwhile. I, it's worthwhile for me. You'll have to decide if it's worthwhile for you. It's worthwhile for me. Pray and say, Lord, some way Help me to get ready so if the Holy Spirit comes in a way that I don't expect, that I still won't reject it. Here's something else that comes in unexpected ways to probably every single Christian. I'm talking about temptation. Our subject is, are you ready for the unexpected Do you have temptations in your life that you never expected that you would have? If any of you had that experience beside me, you, you never imagined that you'd ever have a temptation like that, but bam! The devil tries to bring his most do you know when the devil tries to bring his most powerful temptations against you? The devil studies each one of our characters, so he knows what your besetting sin is, your easily entangling sin. He knows what my besetting sin is. He knows what those things are, and he's getting ready the most powerful temptation on your besetting sin, on my besetting sin, at a time when we're the weakest. Did he do that with Jesus? He came to him after he fasted 40 days. Remember that? Now let's think this through a little bit. At a time when you're weakest, that's when the devil will try to bring the strongest temptation against you. Now let's think, think that through some of the times when we are the weakest. Number one, is a person weaker if they have been deprived of sleep? Yes, they most certainly are. They have less willpower, and they have less power of discernment at a time when they have been, especially if they've been severely deprived of sleep. Now let's just think that through. We all have emergencies when we're deprived of sleep. 
But do you think that we should be careful to not allow ourselves to be deprived of sleep when there's not an emergency that's forcing the issue? Do you think we should? Remember, if you allow yourself to get into a weakened condition, that's when the devil's going to try to strike you with the hardest temptation there is unexpectedly. Let's look at a couple other things. Now, you all know the easy ones. You all know about alcohol. If you drink alcohol, the, cor the cerebral cortex is anesthetized. You, you lose your inhibitions. You lose your ability to make judgments. So then you're, then you're just an open target. That's why the New Testament says, do not be drunk with wine. Don't, don't indulge. In fact, we don't have time to go into this, but I've explained this before. The New Testament is very, very strong in its prohibition against using any alcoholic beverages. But the trouble is, and I want to be as charitable as possible with the Bible translators, but many Bible translators are what we call a moderationist. They believe it's all right to use wine in moderation, and so they tone down the very strong Greek words into very tame English words, which is very unfortunate. So people are completely confused. If you look at the original Greek words in the New Testament, the New Testament prohibits the use of any alcoholic beverages in the strongest possible language. But our translations have toned these words down so that people don't get the point. But you can study that on your own. It, it puts you in a weakened condition, so the devil makes you an open target. Are there other situations be, beside alcohol and deprivation of sleep that make a person so that they're weaker in, res, in regard to discernment and willpower what sickness. sickness that's right sickness a, per a person that's sick is in a weaker condition how about oh, I hate to bring this up maybe I will but, but we'll make it just for a moment then get away from it so you're not hurt too bad overeating does that put you in a weakened condition it absolutely does it, I, I heard, when I was a child, I had a pastor used to say, when you eat too much, all the blood goes to your stomach. You don't have, you don't have enough discernment up here to, to make good judgment. You're, you get, have you ever seen somebody that ate, they ate a great big dinner and they could hardly stay awake afterward? They just got drowsy? See, you're in a weakened condition. And, that, that, and so uh, that's a time when you're in a weakened condition that the devil will try to bring the most powerful temptations against you to try to make you to fall. Here's what Ellen White said about this one time. In the, this is Review and Herald, January 28, 1890. Temptations will come in the most unexpected manner to test us, to determine what is our real faith, our real motive, our real principle. So, temptations will come in an unexpected manner. And this is one of the reasons, by the way, not the only reason, but it is one of the reasons for health reform. Because a health reformer will be in a mental and physical condition to deal with unexpected temptations better than the person that is the opposite. I'll just say the opposite. Not practicing health reform. Well, two last things we're going to study really quickly. The closing up of God's work. Do you believe that God's work is going to be closed up soon? Do you know how it's going to happen? Do you know how it's predicted to happen? Did you know that we've been told that God's work will be closed up in a most unexpected way? We've been told that. I think I have it here. Here it is. It says... The work will most assuredly be cut short in a most unexpected manner. No one will be able to say when the movings of God's Spirit will be realized or what direction or through whom it will manifest itself. But I speak not my own words when I say it will pass by those who have had their test and opportunity and have not distinguished the voice of God or appreciated the movings of His Spirit. So the work is going to close up. And how is it going to close up? It's going to close up in a most unexpected manner. Are you ready for the unexpected? And one final question about being ready for the unexpected.
And that is the danger that we all have of being surprised. There's quite a few warnings in the New Testament about the danger of being surprised. Now, if you're, it's all right to be surprised at the end of the world if it's a happy surprise. <laughs> but if it's not a happy surprise, Ellen White said, she told our ministers that we needed to talk a lot more about this. Let me read that to you. She said, There is a day that God had appointed for the close of this world's history. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's Matthew 24, 14. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. More, much more should be said about these tremendously important subjects. So she said, we're supposed to talk more about it. The day is at hand when the destiny of every soul will be fixed forever. That's the close of probation. That's when the judgment of the living is finished. It's done. This day of the Lord hastens on apace. The false watchmen are raising the cry, all is well, but the day of God is rapidly approaching. Its footsteps, that's when the judgment of the righteous is finished. It's all over. Its footsteps are so muffled that it does not arouse the world from the death-like slumber into which it has fallen. While the watchmen cry peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them, and they shall not escape. That's 1 Thessalonians 5. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. That's Luke 21. It overtakes the pleasure lover and the sinful man as a thief in the night when all is apparently secure and men retire to contented rest. Then the prowling, stealthy, midnight thief steals upon his prey. When it is too late to prevent the evil, it is discovered that some door or window was not secured. Be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. That's Matthew 24. People are now settling to rest, imagining themselves secure under the popular churches. But let all beware, lest there is a place left open for the enemy to gain an entrance. Great pains should be taken to keep this subject before the people. Remember, she's talking about when the judgment of the living is finished. It's all over. The solemn fact is to be kept not only before the people of the world, but before our own churches also, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly, unexpectedly. When does the day of the Lord begin? It begins suddenly, unexpectedly. It begins at the close of probation. At the close of probation, the day of grace is over, the day of the Lord has begun. The solemn fact is to be kept not only before the people of the world, but before our own churches. Also, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly, unexpectedly. By the way, when, when you realize, if you're alive, when you realize that probation is closed, it will already have been closed, perhaps several days, probably at least a week. If you want to check me out on that, just study carefully Great Controversy, page 491. The fearful warning of the prophecy is addressed to every soul. Let no one feel that he is secure from the danger of being surprised. Let no one's interpretation of prophecy rob you of the conviction of the knowledge of events which show that this great event is near at hand. So... It's a question I ask myself. I came here to ask you that question for you to ask yourself. Are you ready for the unexpected? When it comes suddenly, are you ready? Well, we need to be ready. We need to pray that we'll be ready. We need to pray not just for ourselves, we need to pray for each other. I want, I'm telling you the truth when I say this. I want each member of this church to be saved, period. 
I don't want I don't want anybody that's a member here to come up to the end and find out that they're lost. Wouldn't that be the most awful thing? Here you've been a Christian, you've been going to church, you say, Oh, I'm a commandment keeper, and you're lost? That's just too that's just too horrible to contemplate. I don't want that to happen to anybody here. But if it's not going to happen, we have to be ready for the unexpected. Because it's going to happen at an unexpected time. And our sins have to have gone beforehand to judgment. Let's pray before we depart. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have warned us and you have told us what our real situation is. We give you thanks for the plan of salvation that you have made a way at an infinite cost so that every sin that we have ever committed can be forgiven if we're willing to make it evident, if we're willing to confess it and repent of it and forsake it. Lord, we give you thanks that you have made it possible for our page to be made white, for our life record to be cleared, for our character to be changed. We thank you that you have made it possible for each one of us to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and to receive into our heart the Holy Spirit. And Lord, when the Holy Spirit comes in and rebukes us for sin, Lord, give us a humble spirit, a submissive spirit. Help us, Lord, that we may not become stubborn and rebel against the reproof that you sent to us, but help us to realize that these things are necessary so that you can save us, and we pray Lord, I pray for the members of this church that you'll cause the plan of salvation to work out in our lives, that we might be that holy, perfected people that you want us to be. Lord, we cannot do this unless you work a mighty miracles in our lives. And so we pray, as we humble ourselves before you, that you will work out these miracles in our lives and that you will transform each one of us in character so that our character becomes a reflection of the character of our Maker and our Redeemer. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas, 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.